All right. So. Uh, I guess yeah. I'll start then. Yep. So, hello to everyone. Uh, we are presenting on health and wellness, as you can see on the screen. Uh, we have myself, Clara, along with Morton and Nikolai today. So our presentation is actually in three parts, um, starting off with the background, but uh, throughout, if you have any questions or comments, you can use the raise hand option um, in the Zoom meeting, and I will probably be the one to call on you. Um, and then later on, we also have some yes, no questions, so you can agree or disagree and then join the discussion later on. But yes, to get started, um, a little bit of background on the health and wellness. First, to divine health. According to the World Health Organization, um, health is the state of complete men physical, mental, social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And this uh, definition actually dates back to 1948 when they uh, included it in their kind of founding documents. Um, so we use this definition because we were interested in not just um, a physical or medical health, we're also interested in the mental and social well-being as we explored options that exist. So as we know from the uh, topic of this course, we've debated this a few times over um, and I and plan to continue, but one definition of serious games is that it is a game designed for a primary purpose other than pure entertainment. And we stuck with that definition because the main focus, um, as you see later on for us, was uh, rehabilitation. So they might be engaging and entertaining games, but their primary purpose was rehabilitation. So this section, the general uh, series games for health and wellness, definitely covers um, other topics as well. And it begins to encroach on some of the topics that we've actually already discussed in class or have had other groups present on, um, including education and training. So we chose to steer away from those topics. And we have seen this before, so this shouldn't be a shock to anyone. Um, and we don't wanna to spend too much time on it but uh, we highlighted the importance of flow in health and wellness games as uh, the games need to adjust to the challenge level of the users and the, as well as their preference. Um, so this we touch on a little bit later as well. So to narrow down our topic even further, we chose to, well, in our research, we found a whole bunch of different types of games um, when you search basically serious games and health. And we categorized them um, into three varieties. The first of which would be active games. Um, so these are everything from playing tag or hopscotch at recess to um, maybe intramural sports or even professional sports, as well as uh, active games like Wii or Connect that we um, actually explore further on. The second variety would be gamification of activity. Um, a couple examples given were, for example, like a fitness app that tracks um, your individual performance, can give feedback, maybe goals or points along the way, um, and even some gyms like Orange Theory or even Toten in Uovic that will put you on a leaderboard, say for example, with your entire spin class um, or your high intensity interval training so it creates that competitiveness that um, gamifies even just working out. However, it's the third variety that we are interested in, and it's the serious game specifically for health and wellness. And I believe Nikolai is going to take over and share some of our examples. Yep. So we have um, like this, uh, these uh, series games for health and wellness, we have categorized that further into um, four different like categories, which uh, kind of covers uh, a lot of the, the series games within the health and wellness space, although there are certain things that are not covered here. For example, uh, you could arguably say that training health personnel is also 
um, could be done in serious games and could be categorized within this space. But however, we have uh, general well-being and fitness games, which are a bit like a less serious, uh, could be entertainment games, but they have uh, effects or um, make improvements in uh, general like health or wellness for the persons uh, playing them. Uh, so you have, uh, we have also um, like mental and physical within the space. So where mental well-being could be uh, improving cognitive ability like uh, lumin lumosity and brain trainer uh, but it could also be just simple uh, doing puzzles or uh, yeah things that are like physical puzzles or something and then we have uh, physical well-being or fitness which is games uh, like Wii Sports, Kinect Sports uh, that is that are very well known and also, VR games that require body movement, uh, such as Beat Saber and Box VR. And then for the rehabilitation space uh, or category, um, there are some examples uh, where they have uh, good things for psychological issues, such as uh, phobias um, or VR for uh, PTSD. And there seems to be some uh, good like products out there that already exist in this space, which we'll cover a bit further. And then you have the last part, which is uh, physical rehabilitation. <clears throat> uh, for example, after an injury. Um, and in this space, there are, we saw a lot less uh, commercialized products. Um, it was mainly that there are, there exist some products in this space, but it's it's often that there has been done research for a specific hospital or something, and that hospital has had access to that specific uh, prototype of a serious game that they've made. <clears throat> so, yeah, moving on, uh, mental fitness, cognitive improvement could be such as, like I said, Sudoku, uh, or like other puzzles. Um, then you have the Lumosity here, which is a good example of, they have, uh, a lot of different uh, games that touch upon different um, cognitive abilities, such as uh, as memory or uh, reaction time, uh, general uh, lo like yeah, logic, uh, such as the puzzles. So yeah, and then <laughs> in the uh, mental rehabilitation uh, space, we found a really interesting uh, company called Sias. Uh, they have a lot of different um, scenarios that I've, they have made in uh, VR, which is for mostly for exposure treatment uh, for different phobias, but also some other aspects such as uh, social anxiety uh, to some degree. But like our main concern with some of these is that uh, not that we have uh, seen or tried the examples, but we have seen videos and the behavior of uh, the the humans in the um, in the demos. Like they must they must feel kind of realistic. So it's kind of complex to do this both with modeling and AI. Uh, but the, it seemed to it seemed to be something good out of this. Like with exposure treatment in this space. And then we have physical fitness, all these games that most of you probably know. Um, Wii Sports very, uh, uh, was very uh, <coughs> good for the time when it come. Um, and you have, then you have like the improvement in technology here, which is like in Kinect Sports. Uh, pretty similar, but without the controllers, only the infrared camera of the Kinect. Um, and then you have also Box VR, which is, uh, it's, it's kind of a game, but it's, you, Box VR is very much not, you don't have any lose or win condition. You just, you play and it tries to motivate you with music and stuff to, to basically exercise. And it puts you very much in a, 
in a exercise um, environment um, inside like a gym. And then, yeah, for physical rehabilitation, uh, as I said earlier, we have not found too much commercialized products in this space. Um, and although uh, Sunos has a lot of uh, VR stuff and uh, general games for physical rehabilitation, um, so we wanted to check out what uh, they had available. And this is their uh, platform, uh, Spiel die Better, or Play Yourself Better, I guess that's the way to say it. Uh, so you can choose different um, areas of your body that you have to uh, exercise, and it will show you, it will prompt you to uh, this next screen here on the, on the right, uh, giving you like different movements or exercise you could perform. <laughs> so that's kind of, we were kind of, um, it looked really good when we saw it at first. Um, however, when you actually choose one of these exercises, it's, it was a big disappointment because uh, all that you got um, recommended was uh, entertainment games uh, that already exists. So for example, you would choose um, the dorsal flex flexion and it would, for example, say, yeah, you can play uh, Wii Sports tennis and this could make you do this exercise. Um, however, when that is said, uh, Sunos has um, other things in this uh, physical rehabilitation space, but nothing that necessarily is uh, publicly available like this. So, but they do a lot of research in in the rehabilitation space in general, and um, yeah. So. We just thought we wanted to say a little bit about uh, where we are now and how different technologies has affected the uh, serious game space for health and wellness. So uh, one of the first things that came out was the, um, you have the iToy for the PlayStation 2. We wanted to mention this because it was pretty early on and they only did image recognition um, and based on only that, it was they were able to make some games where you, for example, could play uh, uh, table tennis and so on. So, for the time it came out, it it had some really good, um, good games. Kind of, uh, although it was it was for entertainment, and um, it general didn't it didn't it didn't take off. Um, then we have three years later in two thousand six. The Nintendo Wii came along, and that had a lot of good products. And also, it's it, it, as what we have seen from also research, it it gave a burst of energy into um, into different researchers to try out uh, using these controllers and the game platform uh, for motivating exercise. Uh, for people of any age, actually, so that was definitely a big step in this uh, in this uh, serious game space for health and wellness. And then you have um, all those smartphones, arguably were before, but we took the iPhone uh, as that's one of the big uh, in the in the phone space, uh, which came at 2007, and this. Um, has made it possible to uh, make a lot of to oh, what's it called um, gamify different, I guess activities such as uh, running or walking around, and then you have, of course you have uh, newer stuff such as Pokemon Go and so on. And there's a lot of a lot of good games in the space, and also for mental uh, cognitive improvements like Lumosity. Um, and those kind of things ex exists on phone on the app store, and it's basically available anywhere, uh, which is why it's uh, so good for uh, serious games in health and wellness. 
And then 2010, the uh, Kinect came out. Um, and there has been a lot of research done with the Kinect. It has been here for a while and people have been trying to do different things with it. Although we kind of see that there aren't many, there aren't that many, at least for the space we were looking for, the physical um, rehabilitation. There weren't many products which were uh, commercialized or available. It was, like I said earlier, it was basically that this one hospital had researchers make a prototype of a game using the Kinect and they tried it out on a couple of uh, patients. So, but there are definitely a lot of interesting research done with the Kinect. Um, and then for the like the latest uh, part of technology that has come out is uh, VR uh, with Oculus uh, coming around 2016 and uh, about the same for the HTC Vive came a bit later, if I remember correctly. So for future possibilities within the health and wellness space, we were thinking that um, advances in technology could look similar to the uh, VR setup from uh, uh, the Ready Player One movie. Um, and this is a lot of the things that are in this movie are things that are being uh, developed or researched, uh, such as um, omnidirectional treadmills and uh, haptic gloves and suits, which would give you uh, feedback uh, on almost anything. So it would it would just basically make it a lot more immersive. Uh, so it's basically a, a lot of on the immersiveness that are being developed and that can be a lot improved uh, still a lot in this uh, space. And lastly, we would also mention that AR uh, is something that is, we think that there could be a lot of improvements in the AR space. Uh, so, because AR has kind of not taken off yet, it is kind of a, a gimmick uh, to some degree, but we think that it could be uh, an interesting area in the in the future of uh, of also serious games for health and wellness. So, yeah, uh, for the part two of the project, um, me and Nikolai uh, are also taking a course called Integration Project for the Max uh, students. Uh, where we thought that we could uh, combine the two projects uh, and actually develop a prototype for uh, the health and wellness aspect of this course as well. Uh, so um, we initially thought that we would have a lot of time to develop this in the other course, but it turns out that course was more about uh, user innovation and pre-project and didn't really reserve that much time for actually implementation. But uh, yeah, we have made something anyways that we wanted to show you. So uh, the general concept of this is that we wanted to create a centralized uh, virtual reality hub uh, where you could join different types of mini games uh, so that we could explore different areas within uh, health and wellness initially. So that's a reference back to the categorization we did earlier with uh, mental and physical uh, serious and kind of non-serious uh, kind of treatments. Uh, so we wanted a way to like add modularized uh, mini games, uh, so you can join and leave and track your progress along the way. Um, so we ended up focusing more on the motivational exercises. Uh, we struggled a little bit to actually uh, create mini games that had very specific um, patient treatment focus. Uh, this is also partially because. Uh, we didn't have um, enough time to do user testing and more research by, with, for example, talking to uh, people in the field, also because of the whole corona situation where we couldn't actually go and visit uh, people. But yeah, um, our, so, but yeah, so our main customer group was rehabilitation centers. Uh, we planned that out. So that would also mean our main customer user groups uh, but beyond that would be patients at rehabilitation centers. But we also then thought that it would probably also be uh, usable by just an average person who wants to uh, uh, play a physically active game at home. 
Uh, another aspect of this project was that we wanted to add remote monitoring. Uh, so that would mean that a uh, observer or a doctor could monitor a patient's progress. Uh, this you will also see this when we talk about uh, the paper uh, later on when they also did a kind of a same similar thing. So uh, just a quick note on also the picture you see here on the on the right, the GIF. Uh, so uh, when we came to the hub, we thought that most virtual reality kind of similar concepts are very sci-fi and high-tech and closed off inside a room or a, you know, like a sci-fi environment. So we thought it would be nice to add like a very calm, tranquil outside area on a kind of tropical island. Uh, so we that's kind of like the design decision there uh, because also of the age of the intended user groups and uh, so that it will be available for all ages. Yeah. So uh, for the project, we did some preliminary research. Uh, we started off interviewing some of the professors here at school. Uh, Frodo Boln, he is a professor uh, which we all had in scientific methodology last year. Uh, he's also a psychology major. Uh, so we wanted to talk to him and get his insight on the psychological or mental aspect of health and wellness. So uh, we got some very interesting information from him. He uh, specifically mentioned that uh, VR as, for example, exposure treatment would work very well for uh, phobias, for example, or other mental issues where there is a very specific uh, area or object of fear. So that would mean a phobia would have a very specific object of fear and, that, and then uh, exposure treatment in, for example, virtual reality would probably be very effective. But other aspects where, uh, for example, general anxieties and other uh, kind of more uh, vague uh, mental issues would probably not uh, respond well to extra treatment as it will just leave and just don't do it because they would struggle to motivate themselves. So that was very interesting. Uh, we also talked to Anders Petter Andersson, who was a professor in the design department. Uh, he also had some very useful feedback to us about the general idea and uh, he gave us some insight and referred us over to the therapy department. And so we went over there and talked to Doug Waller as well. So yeah, we get, we get a lot of useful information from these professors. But um, we, what we also wanted to do was to actually visit uh, some of the care centers uh, to get some more inside knowledge from uh, healthcare professionals. Uh, so we did uh, contact Haugtun Care Center here in Jövik. Uh, and we were referred over to Sunos Hospital by a dog. Uh, but yeah, so uh, also then due to the corona situation, we were not able to actually uh, do all of this research we had planned out to do. Uh, so we also just listed those out there. So we wanted to visit Houghton Care Center to talk to some of the doctors there or to uh, gain some knowledge before, uh, to get some ideas about games, talk about them, what would be good to implement, what would probably not be a good idea to implement. Uh, and then we would also like to visit them around now when we are kind of done and uh, take what we have already made and shown it to them to ask them for feedback uh, if they thought that it was well implemented or not. Uh, we also wanted to talk to the ergotherapy department and engineer now after we have developed what we have done. Uh, and yeah, just get general feedback from actually professionals that would help a lot. So because of um, our lack of like actually talking to healthcare professionals, that's why we kind of also decided to make some more generalized, more fun uh, activity-based games, uh, which are a little bit more non-specific to a specific injury. So yeah. Can I go to the next slide? Yeah, thanks. So uh, these are the specific mini games that we have developed. The first one we made like a, a we call it like a duck shooter. Uh, it looks like the Space Pirate Trainer VR game, if anyone has heard of that. Uh, so it's basically you're in a, a sci-fi city and there are drones that uh, shoot these uh, projectiles at you and you have to dodge them. So you have to move around a lot and you also have to shoot them. So you have lives and there are waves and it restarts when you die. So it's a pretty simple game, but we thought it would be nice if uh, it were fun to have a lot of music and noise and uh, haptic feedback when you get hit and hit targets and so forth. So that it would be a fun game to play uh, where you also just move around a lot. So, uh, and we also made a platform type of game. Uh, this is kind of interesting because this was kind of inspired by a game called Kinect Adventures for the Xbox Kinect, as we mentioned earlier. 
so the, this, there are these um, uh, things that objects that come uh, towards you and you stand in place and you have to dodge the red ones and hit the, hit the green ones. Uh, so there's also uh, music and haptic feedback for this one as well. Yeah, and lastly, this was more of like a, uh, uh, like a proof of concept that we did early on to check out like the mini game stuff. So this is from a uh, actually physical device that we kind of like remember that we had heard of some time ago. Uh, so this was initially to you train uh, the reaction yeah. time. Sorry? Yeah. Your microphone just cut a bit, uh, but it's fine now. Yeah. So uh, this was, uh, as I said, um, built for uh, football goalkeepers to train their reaction time and coordination, like hand-eye coordination. Uh, so these uh, blinking lamps would make a sound and then light up, and then you would have to hit it within a certain amount of time. Uh, so we thought it would be fun to implement that in VR uh, to train both a kind of like a mental or cognitive ability uh, reaction time and also to make you move a lot to jump up and down and yeah, as you see in the picture there. So yeah, I think that's the mini games and then we have a, like a demo to show you. Yeah, so I have a video here. I hope it displays correctly and that there will be sounds. Let's see. So yeah, there should be some sound. Um, I guess I can just say a little bit like you saw earlier on uh, of the overview. This is like our uh, just hub area. We have not, uh, we have wanted to make it really obvious where you are going to go. That is not the case at the moment, uh, how to interact yet. Um, but we're focused on making like this bit um, like we said a, a chill environment for uh, for the people in here not feel like a closed in environments more like an open inviting environment rather and then we thought of that we would have uh, different um, items around here in this hub uh, such as leaderboards and uh, trophies that you would get from uh, from different games uh, for completing certain tasks such that you could feel uh, yeah, that the environment would change based on things you have uh, managed to do in the games. So yeah, here's the duck shooter example. Um, so, you, yeah, like Morton already has explained, you have to just dodge uh, uh, the bullets that come towards you and, uh, yeah, shoot the drones basically. So, and then it will come through for several waves uh, if you are able to complete them. So now it's like on wave two and uh, it would go on. Yeah, and then for the second game here, which was, was the first game we implemented in, uh, we will, which is the reaction time trainer. Um, so the, the different balls that light up will make a noise as well. So it's kind of training both um, hand-eye coordination, but also uh, spatial sound awareness to some degree. I don't know if the you guys could hear the sounds, but uh, yeah. <laughs> and for the platform game. there are like there are no uh, win or lose conditions kind of um, it's only that you would get uh, a better score the better you perform uh, in these games 
That's also was kind of our intention to not make the user, which are supposed to be motivated to move, to not be discouraged by losing, but rather just encouraged by getting a better score, which was our intention. Something else that we've also tried is to, in all our minigames, we, we know that moving around in VR uh, can, can cause um, a bit of um, motion sickness. So we try to make it so that all our games, you are pretty stationary and there are objects moving around towards you or around in your space, rather than having, um, for example, you move towards the objects and then the world just flies around you, that would cause a lot of motion sickness. Uh, yeah, Let's see. So to touch upon some of the gamification elements, um, we have uh, designed our uh, games around that the difficulty can be adjustable uh, to fit the, the person playing them. Um, and at the moment, it is adjustable by ourselves, but we also would like to have it that the uh, difficulty levels would uh, see your performance or your preferences that you could put, and then it would scale uh, accordingly. And then we have the achievement system, which we have implemented, which is for at the moment just UI displaying uh, different achievements. <laughs> uh, we also wanted to have this, um, as physical trophies or objects in in the um, in the hub that would uh, decorate the hub the more you the more you play or uh, perform different things in the in the games so and then again uh, when we talked to Anish Peter Andersson, he emphasized a lot on the he, he has a music design background, uh, or sound rather, but he emphasized a lot on how, how much impact uh, music could impor, um, improve um, performance of, uh, of people playing exercises, uh, kind of. So we, yeah, we try to have that, and we have that in one game as of now, uh, but it's also something we have always considered uh, uh, both uh, sounds, uh, so feedback from your actions and haptic feedback, but also music to motivate uh, exercise. And then again, like we also already have touched upon to have the hub environment be just a really relaxing open area. To move on uh, further, um, the remote monitoring system uh, would be so that, uh, which we have designed this for observers uh, to see their patients, uh, how they perform or things they do within the system. So observers could be therapists, uh, doctors, nurses, anyone that would need to monitor how their patient performs in the system. Um, and it would include both that they could see that the patients or people do the exercises they are supposed to, but also to track their uh, performance, see improvements, uh, and on that knowledge, they could give you uh, recommendations uh, of exercises they should do um, to help their rehabilitation. So uh, some metrics uh, could be, for example, uh, metrics is basically the things that uh, is displayed to the observers and are tracked within the game. Uh, and that could be uh, obvious stuff such as uh, playtime score, uh, but it could also be things like total arm movement in meters, uh, total feet movement in meters, uh, heart rate, uh, maximum heart rate, average beat per minute, and uh, so on. So we think these are interesting things that uh, health personnel definitely could see the benefit of, which also are, uh, in regards to the paper we read, uh, seems to touch upon some of the uh, same uh, interesting aspects. 
And also just a quick note that uh, the achievement system uh, that we have made would be uh, recommendations would pretty much work in the same fashion. So there would be recommendations listed up and then the uh, person playing could track their progress towards uh, completing and fulfilling these uh, recommendations. Yeah, in terms of future future work, uh, we wanted to want to look on like multiplayer would be definitely interesting um, because it could bring a new social aspect to uh, the game and the experience. And we think that socializing these um, these activities can do a lot of things to your motivation, either through uh, challenges. So for example, I play uh, and I get a challenge from, from Martin and he says, uh, hey, I did this, can you try to beat my score or something like that? We think that could be definitely interesting, but also to actually have a uh, live multiplayer. So, uh, and we also had that in our mind when designing our mini games so that uh, it could be possible to have a setup where you have multiple people playing the same uh, mini games together in a space. Uh, also, uh, as we didn't get to do that so much in this uh, for now, um, in our game so far, we would like to really deep dive into uh, some specific injury and hand like Taylor, make Taylor made uh, activities or games that they uh, would do to rehabilitate those uh, such injuries. And then further on, we think that enhancing and simplifying the UI uh, and user experience in general is something that could uh, improve things a lot, especially as we kind of designed this, this hub as it was supposed to be for any age group. Um, but I, I think that there are definitely things that we would see and notice very quickly uh, trying this out on different uh, user groups or, uh, or age groups, uh, which would mean that we would make uh, or need to make uh, specific changes to how uh, the user interacts within the hub. And yeah, like I stated, stated earlier as well, that difficulty should adjust based on the person's uh, performance. Uh, that should be nice if that was doing uh, automatically adjusting it and also that the um, person could give preferences such that if or or the uh, health personnel that could uh, in the thought scenario prescribe this software for someone that they would uh, say that for example this person should should uh, do things that are relaxing and not to be under big pressure or something for some reasons, for example. Um, and then the difficulty would adjust based on that knowledge. Uh, also looking into psychological issues we think would be definitely really interesting. Um, so for example, uh, stroke treatments, we don't know how that would be in VR. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and could be interesting to see how how different specific psychological issues could be treated um, with specific activities. And uh, like mentioned before, for example, with phobias, uh, um, with exposure treatments, like we had discussions with uh, Frode Walden about. So yeah, that is our first part. So the question now kind of is, do any of you have any feedback or questions to us? Uh, oh, I have a question. Uh, I mean, maybe it's a feedback, I don't know. Uh, what kind of sensors are you using uh, to detect the hands? Like the, I see the game, uh, the, when you move your, uh, in that, the, the shapes come and you touch with your hand, like how it, it's like working there. Yeah, that, that, that one, yeah. The, the hand movement, like when you touch it, like how does it sense like? Yeah, so this well, is, uh, yeah, you can. Yeah, you can answer it. You can, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, so this is a uh, VR setup. So we're using HTC Vive in this example, but it would work with any Steam VR uh, headset and setup. So here there are like uh, the, we have HTC Vive headsets and the controllers and they use, uh, I don't remember exactly, but yeah, yeah sensors. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's like uh, the tool you you should uh, uh, like keep it on your hand, and you have the VR glass like uh, two 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 uh, things on your hand, and you have VR glass, and you play it, right? Yeah. So everything that is being tracked is only your hands and your head, basically. Okay. Okay. Yep. And uh, I I I got uh, some ideas uh, as you uh, like you mentioned. You want some rehabilitation and that kind of stuff. I don't know, like it's just uh, like my ideas, maybe you take or leave it. Uh, about the uh, eyes, uh, many people are suffering from uh, eyes side uh, like damage because of these uh, technologies and the, like the uh, addiction to the technologies. Uh, I, I would believe the rehabilitation, like the moving your eyes uh, will make your uh, eye, eyesight really good. And it would be kind of, I think, a good addition uh, to your games in case you consider. And the second thing is maybe the hand uh, rehabilitation. The when because if you like break your uh, legs, it's uh, less damage than you break your uh, hands because without your hands you can you can do you cannot do a lot of things. So uh, yeah, this is kind of two ideas that pop up after your presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. That's definitely interesting points. I think uh, um, the eyes thing, the eye thing as well in VR. I don't know how that would be because you are looking at a screen that is basically a few uh, millimeters away from your eyes. But it's it's a bit interesting also because, for example, me, I have a, I'm like um, seeing what is it called. I'm far sighted, so. Without glasses, I have struggles with seeing, but in VR, it imitates uh, that things are far away, even though the screen is a couple uh, millimeters from my eyes. So I can see perfectly well, actually, inside VR. So, yeah. Yeah, just another point to that. Uh, the newest HTC Vive uh, Pro glasses, uh, they have started implementing eye tracking into those. So they're going to use them for some sort of uh, interaction. But I'm not sure quite uh, like what it is yet, and it hasn't been used a lot yet. But I think it's like being developed. Yeah, I think uh, you can, you can use that eye tracker only to, uh, to detect the movement of the eye. This is kind of exercise for the eye, so that's that's enough. <laughs> I think. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Well. Oh. I think it's really, really insightful. Um, I mean, uh, on the one hand, we uh, who, who, we can continue this discussion after a break, if you like, or continue now because I have a few comments as well. But what's the general sense of, uh, sense here of the ones that are available? Do you want to have a break first before we continue a bit, or do you want to uh, just continue and then move to the paper? Who wants a break? Clear indication of a break need. People can practice using the buttons because we're going to use them later on. Ah, right. They're very good. Thanks, Clara. So use some buttons, guys. Uh, we see some people. It's a minor quorum. But since there's a default expectation that there would be a break, I guess we can have that briefly. Um, I, I'll, I'll have some follow-up questions later, but we can keep them later. They are not, uh, you know, uh, require this immediacy. So should we take a break until um, when? You guys, what, what what time is sensible for you guys? What do you think? Ten past. That should be fine. Yeah. So we ten past one. We continue there, and then uh, uh, we can. Uh, I have a few follow-up questions. We go from there. Cool. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. I think it's really helpful and really good, actually. Um, so it was really uh, instructive and very clear what you're talking about, and it's really helpful for the discussion point. So uh, see you in a bit. So, welcome back. Room still full with 23 people. That's good. Always a good sign. Um, yes. Um, 
I believe you guys want to talk about the paper uh, more generally, but be before we do that, um, can I can I um, just um, add some comments regarding the um, presentation first, regard or, or more um, regarding the um, application as well that you develop. So. Um, um, I find your, your project is fairly full-fledged, so I have the impression, are you guys planning to make your masters out of this? Um, we haven't initially thought about it that much. It could be a possibility for sure. I mean, just, just looking at the scope and the intensity and the intents behind it, because you um, it seems like you at least looked at validation quite extensively. And that's usually the hardest bit of um, such activities to actually find some, you know, customer, if you like, that has potential interest in it, and that you can use to actually assess as to whether your 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 framework actually makes sense, right? It's especially with respect to the mini games. So, um, I mean, if you if you plan to do it, I I think it's a really really would be a really good move already because you have set. Uh, solid groundwork and I think anyone you would talk to they would get a quick appreciation of what you're doing right they get to get a feel um, uh, they, they, they would get a feel uh, in uh, about um, um, you know what, what your plan would be um, one specific uh, if you go back to page eight uh, I think Nikolai's you're running the slides right I believe yeah um, uh, page eight you have this uh, matrix um, of different types of games. Um, yeah, this one. This one. So did you come up with this yourself? Yeah, this cool. was something that we kind of defined, yeah. Very nice. Um, I think it's very nice. This is a kind of a typical, um, people often or have asked me in the past, you know, what, what is a good synthesis uh, uh, outcome or structural outcome of your paper or discussion? And that's that's something like this can be uh, an example for this, right? Either a tabular overview or structuring the field in this way, right? So that you pretty much can allocate any contribution in, you know, in, in, in systematically and then discuss it and capture it on, on with respect to different dimensions. For example, here you have a very nice example where you have on the one hand, the game experience, uh, basically, you know, what you want to achieve, what you want to do, but you can overlay it, for example, then with technology, right? The different technologies that applies to those, the apply to those, those different quadrants, right? Within this, this matrix uh, um, 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 approach here, right? So in some cases, VR is more suitable. In other cases, some, you know, um, other tech may be equally suitable. For example, general well-being fitness. If you're not constrained with respect to your movement, then a smartphone may well do the job because you can use some sort of, you know, uh, health kits or whatever else to track your fitness level when you, for example, run outside or in, 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 in gyms or the like. So I think that's a really nice move and you probably would want to uh, uh, use this as a basis or outcome up to you um, of, of, of the, the overview paper and kind of link link perhaps your efforts to it. So that's really nicely um, done. Um, one, one comment on the lower right quadrant, uh, physical therapy. Um, I agree there's uh, probably very limited commercialization, but there's a lot of research in this area, right? Um, which you probably have found. And uh, uh, just, just one specific point, uh, because I, uh, I learned about it, is the um, augmented mirror box. Did you come across this? I don't think so. No. It, it's basically uh, for, um, uh, yeah, for rehabilitation, in uh, or physical rehabilitation post-stroke. Uh, you know, like uh, that you that you need to um, uh, learn. As it actually kind of mirrors some of the challenges that were outlined in the papers that you uh, gave us for 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 um, as in a part for preparation for this lecture. Um, uh, but the idea is there to have an um, I th yeah, it's an augmented mirror box, so an augmented environment in which uh, um, patients are encouraged to you know relearn the use of their neglected site, for example, or to activate some sort of body awareness in the first place. So perhaps that's something to just you know follow up on as part of your discussion because I think that would complement quite nicely into what uh, you're doing. In this, independent of whether it's VR or AR, it doesn't shouldn't really matter, I believe. So, but I think that's a very uh, would be a very easy extension um, there. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at um, uh, slide 23. So forward again. <laughs> That's one um, thought. Um, I was thinking about. I mean, you have you have this um, in-game uh, feedback for all specific mini games that give the um, um, user participants feedback based on their um, 
uh, you know, specific game they're playing in terms of and using me mechanisms such as scoreboards and, and, and points and all that kind of stuff. But I was wondering, uh, would you consider it useful to provide such a panel in, in of course, possibly a different form because here this is geared at, at observers for self-inspection as well. So basically that I know, first of all, which games I play, how well I do in those different games and so on. And, and, and use this perhaps as a motiva motivational tool uh, for the player, right? Because perhaps I'm more reflective and receptive after play about my play than I am in play, if, if that makes remotely sense. Yeah, I think I understand. That's what you mean, like to use this um, to have a kind of user and not observer side on this panel as well, so you can reflect on what you have done. Precisely. Or, exactly. Yeah. So I mean, we did uh, we did discuss to maybe also make some integrations with, for example, mobile apps or uh, oh, yeah. smartwatches, so you yep. could track, for example, a heartbeat through a smartwatch, and it could be cool to have this view also as an app for the yeah. patient. I, I can I can that's that's a clever idea integrating this further with the uh, um, um, sensors that you may have at available. That's a good very good point. Yeah, but so that would be an easy extension, basically, right? Different vision view on the same kind of uh, tool. Uh, but I could imagine that this could be quite helpful depending on 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 players because if I see I perform particularly well in one game, not so much in the other. But if, imagine someone who is uh, a moderate, you know, uh, similar to the paper that you provide us, more uh, some some cognitive impairment, and it maybe um, I I can um, uh, see how well or bad I uh, perform, or relatively moderate I perform in a given game. But it's probably much more clear to see it in direct comparison, which you can offer here, right? Very explicitly saying, oh, you're actually doing very well in this one, not so well in that one, right? So you can have certain level of abstractions where you just highlight, you know, what is your performance high, very high moderate as opposed to giving explicit, uh, 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 attaching explicit numbers to it or whatever else. So you can even accommodate the uh, level of the cognitive load you want to expose to the user as well, depending on their respective um, um, issues. That um, would also sometimes yeah. be addressed in like a therapy setting where if you're working with a physical therapist, they would like ask you how you're doing, like in a more traditional standard setting. They would ask you how you're doing and then like compare of like, oh, you did more than last week. Good job. Or like you need to improve from this. So it's normally already shared between the patient and their healthcare professional in that case. Ah, okay. Right. So you, you, you were seeing this as a complementary effort to the traditional setting. Uh, yeah, potentially. They, we'd also t discussed using this as more of like remote monitoring. So mm. you don't necessarily have to be in hospital or in um, the rehab center, it could be done via like video call or something else for your yep. like checkup with your patient further on. Very nice. That's a very good move. Yeah. I think it's definitely an interesting point here to also um, that it gives more room for reflection for the uh, the user on itself as well uh, after after playing games um, to sit down and like see how you actually perform. Um, mm -hmm. on actual numbers and not just how you feel within the play, I guess, within the games. Exactly. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just thinking about if you want to make this a, for example, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, I'm thinking more in terms of if that uh, whole project was to be kind of a master's level exploration, it would offer a very cheap and uh, nice avenue for um, uh, assessing this as well. Right to see, for example, you provide this remote monitor or this monitoring facility, and then you, you for other patients, patients you don't provide it, and see if that makes any difference. Right? Perhaps there are certain types of people, again, talking player personas and all that kind of stuff, explorer versus you know uh, competitor and so on, for, for for whom this may be more helpful to actually learn uh, about their performance than the in-game metrics that you provide to either one. Right? So that that's the only thinking there behind it. But it's 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 just an angle I don't know. Right? So. I don't know. Um, one comment more, slide 24, if you can go back to that one, see if I recall the comment. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so uh, the um, the only thought that I have while you were talking about this, not, not, not that it's a specific extension or anything like this, and perhaps you captured it already explicitly or implicitly, was really more to have a, um, so you were talking about point four. There was a difficulty adjust based on performance, basically the idea that the game automatically seeks balance with respect to the user's abilities. 
and um, a, a, a thought that was there is also that the so so every time you think about you you, you do this you assume you have a baseline which uh, at which the user is e either easily performs or fails right it's too hard or too simple. I'm uh, wondering if the baseline could be largely specified by a uh, or prescribed, right? So you, you mentioned the idea you're prescribing games, uh, and then the practitioner could also prescribe a certain level of difficulty initially, so as to motivate the player, right? If it's too easy, then the per person may not play, right? And if it's too hard, of course, they will give up immediately. And we saw this quite nicely in the uh, discussion paper that you provided for the session as well, where where the, the the leveling and the type of game was really really important to to maintain motivation, and the only point is there really that you can part of the uh, parameterization of the game could be offloaded to the practitioner itself, as opposed to leaving the full responsibility to the game to figure out how well or badly a, a, a participant actually performs. Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely an interesting uh, thought. Um... Yeah, because we have thought about that you prescribe like certain games, but not necessarily that they define how the difficulty will be for the patient or uh, user that would use this. We, I, mean, I guess the example that we had given in our um, discussing it as a group had been um, like uh, if you're playing like Beat Saber or Guitar Hero or something like that and you miss X number of like boxes or notes, then it comes across as like you failed mm. rather than perhaps slowing down or changing the difficulty level to maintain the engagement because the goal with the rehab is usually performing a, like longer exercises for a longer duration rather mm. than winning or losing. Very nice, exactly. So you have the kind of a different, uh, <laughs> if you want to put it abstractly from a game perspective, different win conditions mm -hmm. from a game perspective. And that is maintaining the, 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 the focus and motivation as long as possible. That is basically the win for you as a, uh, how do you, for, for the intervention basically, right? So yeah, um, yeah. very nice, very nicely put. Uh, remember to discuss those deviating objectives, right? Because they're, they're really, important to highlight that is probably you know one of one of the aspects that is central in in the context of wellness slash uh, uh, um, serious games for health and serious games more generally anyway um so it's a really nice example of how it um the motivation can translate uh, from extrinsic to intrinsic i also um, think that that specific point was also a reference to the paper uh, where they mentioned that they yeah. could adjust mm -hmm. difficulty in real time uh, from the patient's or mm -hmm. uh, point of view or the, um, the observer's point of view so what we thought that a uh, part of that could probably largely be automated based on the performance of the user yeah I can see that as well. I, I totally can see that. Uh, the, 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 only, the only concern is the initial level, right? So how you get this right. Mm, yeah. I, I just don't know if they are. So generally I would say, okay, if you start from too simple and be, become incrementally harder, that is retraceable. I'm just not sure if there are circumstances, personality or conditions that would demotivate the users even in such settings. You, you follow my thought? Right, so it's too easy. Yeah. They may already give, give up. I, I just don't know because that's the conventional way of uh, doing auto balancing. Uh, but I, I just don't know. Yeah. Hmm. Um, cool. Well, well, thank you very much. In any case, I think it's really interesting because you provided a concrete conceptual example of how you could think about, uh, you know, uh, serious games for, for uh, well-being. And I think you really set a nice level of groundwork here. And of course, it's not fully done, not fully fledged. You don't have a evaluation, which is uh, beyond the NEFX expectation we would have had anyway. But uh, I think it's a really good uh, prototype already to actually show practitioners and say, hey, are you interested to push this, right? So, or shall we go further with this? Because uh, even the uh, uh, least technologically affine medical professional would immediately able to appreciate what, 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 which angle you're taking on this, right? As opposed to having a, you know, a large uh, motivation based on slide set or otherwise, but you have something tangible you can actually start off from. And that's really, really helpful. So uh, I think it's a really great effort you actually put, put, uh, uh, put forth here and into it. And I think um, that that's really well situated in this kind of course to kind of try and, you know, push something uh, towards a conceptual prototype, even though we rarely see this. So uh, well done on those ground and on, on this ground in particular. So thank you very mm -hmm. much. And if you, I mean, I would encourage you to push this further 
uh, I mean, you know, on your own terms and, and your, based on your own interest, of course. But if you if you wanted to, I think it would be a great uh, move to push this further um, in in terms of your master's where you can. You mentioned already that you have limited op opportunities to exploit this, for example, in the um, uh, integration project. But but you know, I mean, there is there is a master's beyond that as well. Um, cool. Um, I think we should move to the paper, otherwise we run out of time for this one. <laughs> Uh, sorry for for dragging this on, but uh, I think you you gave a nice opening, so now th that's what you got in return. So, <laughs> um, all right, please, the floor is yours again. Well, we had intended to keep this the actual presentation of the paper short, um, but I wanted to check in with the class uh, using the yes or no buttons. Um, how many people have read the paper? So we're a mix of it. So I will go into a couple of like the basics so that you can join in with the discussion either way. Um, so yeah, the paper is titled Encouraging Brain Injury Rehabilitation Through Ludic Engagement. Um, and it was originally presented at a conference in 2014. The conference has a big fancy name saying Universal Access in Human Computer Interaction. Um, those of my classmates that are interaction designers will recognize this uh, as a fancy way, or maybe even the old er version of saying um, user centered design in interaction design, um, specifically focusing on aging in assistive environments. Um, though aging is the title here, um, and the study was done with uh, Royal Berkshire Hospital and elderly rehabilitation. Um, the paper does make a good point that uh, brain injury. Uh, happens to everyone um, at any age um, and actually males uh, was it 18 to 24 I believe are actually at some of the highest risk for brain injury um, usually due to accidents so um, yes it was a combined effort from the University of Reading uh, Berkshire Hospital and the Brain Injury Association all from the UK on to the next one. Um, two specific terms from the paper, one of which is acquired brain injury. Um, this is uh, technically a medical term, but it is relatively self-explanatory. Um, it's all brain injuries that have been acquired since birth. Um, it can include traumatic ones, car accidents, um, falls, uh, sports injuries, as well as uh, injuries that result from, for example, tumor or stroke or brain hemorrhaging. Um, the main focus in this area was stroke, um, as it's one of the most common. However, um, even with stroke um, injuries, every person experiences different symptoms um, and can result in very, very different um, kind of continuation and rehabilitation requirements after the fact. Um, but the focus of the paper was using uh, ludic engagement, which is basically a scientific way of saying playful. Um, so using play as an engagement um, and also using it to kind of distract from the fact that they're doing work towards the rehabilitation. Um, and it's been proven to work in ways such as um, distracting from pain or teaching um, people how to manage their kind of new normal after a uh, brain injury. So we've condensed down the abstract for those that have not uh, read the paper. Um, that it started working with the uh, Microsoft Connect and they used off the shelf games with some of their uh, rehabilitation patients. And you can see in figure one that the patients are engaging with the games during the study. Um, so you have some of the healthcare professionals working alongside um, some of the patients to assist them and uh, work with them to become more comfortable or be able to achieve certain things in the games. Um, but they discovered that there was some 
uh, difficulties that the patients had with some of the games. And while it did encourage them and they had, a lot of the patients had fun doing it, um, the, they decided or de chose to develop what they call the PER system. So it is a prescription software for use in recovery and rehabilitation. So uh, like we had in our little, like we said in our little discussion that it is like prescription based, um, that the uh, healthcare professionals, um, their physical therapists um, and occupational therapists are usually the ones prescribing these um, activities to their patients in order to encourage and promote rehabilitation. So we pulled uh, some of the pictures from the uh, paper as well. So figure two uh, shows the uh, therapist view, which um, has some metrics on it, but uh, this kind of idea was taken uh, further and developed for um, by the boys so that the therapists actually can track metrics um, that they would normally require in the or normally use throughout their therapy sessions. Um, they made it, there's a comment in the paper about um, just getting a score on a game isn't necessarily uh, the indicator that the therapists are working for. But yes, if they scored 100 last time and scored 120 this time, then it, it can be seen as positive improvement but you don't know if they've actually been doing full range of movement or various other things. So they were interested in slightly different metrics. However, the paper didn't describe which metrics they were interested in. Um, they showed some of the patients and uh, some of the staff interacting with the game when they were testing it. Um, and one of the versions seen in figure four can be adjusted for personal preferences. Um, so while we don't quite understand what the uh, walrus and the cat are doing, you can apparently be in space or you can go for a walk in a park. So I'll pass it uh, over. Yeah. Yeah. Morton so, can lead the um, discussion. <laughs> so what we thought we would do is to try to uh, take advantage of the yes and no buttons in the Zoom chat. So. Uh, to kind of kick off the discussion a little bit to make it easier for you guys to interact. So uh, we have uh, just uh, uh, have a couple of uh, like phrases there so that you can either agree or disagree with. Uh, so the first one kind of relates to the, the PER system that they developed in the paper uh, that uh, helped um, disabled people use games. So we kind of started a discussion earlier about if um, it is the game developer's responsibility to create uh, these types of uh, accessibilities. Uh, for example, we thought that if, for example, the, um, the Kinect system or the games that were developed for it already had uh, functionality for this, then there were, would be no need for the PER system at all to be uh, developed. So yeah. So the first phrase is, is, there, is it the responsibility of the game developers to create off-the-shelf games that are accessible for people with disabilities? So you can disagree or agree. And then also, if you want to turn on your mics and explain why. So I'm counting about half and half. Some agree, some disagree. Is anyone willing to share their thoughts on the matter? I see if you are. Uh, I'm just going to jump in and uh, say why I believe no. Uh, I think that uh, it's really up to the market to to decide whenever they want to develop a certain game. So uh, th there is no forced responsibility. Uh, however, if they see there is a market for it, they should be free to go for it. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, that's a good point. 
Uh, it could also be interesting if there were some sort of a universally agreed upon standard for these types of things, such as there are some of them for web development, for instance. Mm -hmm. Sigurd, would you like to join in? That's not a strong opinion, but I'd say yes, because if you just design for everybody, then it's just better. But again, as with Bjorn, I said, market decides, so no strong opinion. Yeah, I guess I can go next. Uh, I think it really depends on the game because uh, in some games, this kind of uh, adjustment would be much easier than other types of games. Like it's hard to, uh, uh, like a very complicated RPG, you wouldn't be able to as easily change to uh, make it more accessible to other people uh, with disabilities. Um, but in smaller types of games, like these Kinect games, it wouldn't really be that much more work, and you would reach out to a bigger market. You get the possibility to like sell a bunch of games and consoles to like rehabilitation centers and all kinds of stuff. So I really think that uh, it could benefit the developers as much as the users, in that sense. Mm -hmm. I think there is some sort of responsibility because as artists, we should make our art accessible. This is, uh, it's probably very like subjective and individual, but I feel that uh, to some degree, it could affect the uh, patient with like having associations to their time in the hospital and maybe not wanting to think about uh, that if they didn't know. Uh, and like wanting to go back to a normal life at home, then maybe they don't want to bring unnecessary things from the hospital back to their home. So maybe it could be different games available at the hospital and different games available at home to like counter that in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree with uh, Christopher that it would depend. Um, I think it also has to do a lot with the uh, positioning and kind of even almost how the rehabilitation exercises are marketed towards the patients. Because one of the comments that kind of stuck out to me from the paper was that um, the patient couldn't understand how like these kind of standard exercises were actually going to improve um, his day to day life. And yeah, Tom's comment that it would be similar with traditional physiotherapy um, and trying to continue it beyond the hospital um, or the rehabilitation center where they're regularly being interacting with their therapists um, in a medical setting um, or even um, having appointments scheduled where they go to the hospital um, maybe once or twice a week for their therapy sessions. So it does depend on kind of how it's been prescribed and set up. But I think uh, there's a possibility that the marketing of like here, you can take this gaming system and go home and play with your kids and your grandkids. Um, it might still, you might still see an improvement from just a asking them to go home and do 20 bicep curls every day. So going through the chat, um, I think it's difficult to make a conclusion based on one patient's opinion. I would be inclined to agree with you, Charlotte. Um, and then to be able to get those games online and interact with the therapist, um, that was kind of one of the ideas of remote monitoring. <laughs> And other people also agreeing that we need an it depends button when it comes to zoom but, um, perhaps following up uh, with, with on your comment clara i agree totally agree with you in fact what you're alluding to is there should be a gamification of the uh, you know um rehabilitation environment right so because by, by suggesting oh you know actually today we're not doing any program but we have this game there for you if you want play with this or not right because it, it, it activates possibly intrinsic motivation in the light of you know otherwise uh, limited choices 
and, and, and it puts it in a situation as if you are uh, spending leisure time on it as opposed to, uh, you know, administering. Uh, okay, today we're doing 20 minutes of, uh, you know, ga gaming <laughs> followed then by uh, our usual physiotherapy uh, session or whatever else, right? So if you really embed it in this way, introduce it in this way, in addition to the idea of actually using possibly different games in different settings, I think you would have a much greater achievement. I think it's just the framing, as you as you said it, uh, that's decisive in 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 in, in you know uh, achieving anything there. Because I mean, otherwise you could also argue, well, you know, in the hospital I was forced to eat, therefore therefore I'm not eating at home, right? So it's like roughly the same argumentation from a logical point of view. So it's really most likely about framing that uh, could make a difference here. Yeah? Morton also re-highlighted the point that it's coming secondhand from the wife's opinion of what she like sees and experiences from her husband. So yeah, we've made it to two o'clock. Yeah. Is there anything else yeah. that anyone would like to add? <laughs> Was that your um, uh, success condition, win condition, to make it to two o'clock? <laughs> <laughs> no, it definitely uh, uh, um, evidence good planning. So you had a very well planned out session, both in both parts, the initial part of the discussion and the second one as well, which is really uh, well motivated. And you use this idea of actually, you know, uh, f uh, fostering stimulating discussion amongst us here, really, to 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 get this going, I I irrespective of the quality of the paper. So it's a really um, good um, good move. But I think this paper is still valuable in an, uh, to highlight an example of a purely narrative approach, right? In this case, completely undersampled, but you know, avoiding any sort of systematic evaluation uh, at all, which is common in some disciplines, less so, especially in computer science. But um, you know, we, we want to cover diversity of different approaches um, there. So anyway, so it was quite. Uh, so thank you very much for preparing this. I think it's really, really helpful. But I want to leave you space in, in case anyone has thoughts or questions they want to voice. Otherwise, I will say something about uh, exams. I have a question, Professor. To me or to the presenter? Uh, to you, but uh, I oh. don't know if it's like good uh, at this point to ask uh, about the master's thesis uh, pattern. Uh, the, the, you the you com yeah you mm -hmm. commented that uh, it's kind of good idea to have a matrix if you develop the game, and you have a matrix uh, to have a, a like um, to know the how the users are using and what kind of benefit like quantitative analysis to use from that matrix. And what if the, the, the we consider this is a, like really interesting way of uh, completing master's thesis? And what if we will have some design uh, conclusion? Like let's say we will develop one game, uh, which is also good design and good, but we will change after some point uh, with uh, a, like different uh, point of view that design and uh, compare the results like we will have some metrics, you know, like in the, that game and compare that, let's say, uh, if we design is we, uh, if we design the game with, I don't know, some, um, uh, I don't know, uh, probably blue and uh, green. And the next one is like, or maybe the shapes are different or some kind of design uh, feature is different uh, in the two cases. And we compare and uh, based on that, give a little bit conclusion let's say this design uh, being approved as a good design in the games uh, according to this metrics and this quantitative analysis is it the good uh, uh, how to say example or way of doing uh, i i don't 100 percent follow but i'll try um so um I mean, there's two aspects. That's more master thesis talk, but um, we can we can continue this on. Uh, I believe Wednesday we have a session. I get to that in a second. Uh, but uh, to make it short, fundamentally, if we're talking about uh, metrics as measures, not the metrics that uh, we talked about just before. Um, uh, of course, you want to have metrics where possible to afford a discussion. Uh, if you're in specific example, you're having an existing application, you want to identify as to whether uh, making background blue uh, provides any significant, uh, you know, impact on user behavior. I think that would probably rather fall under a, uh, a design problem rather than a classical applied computer science theme. Um, 
right? So, and even there, you of course need to relate it to, you know, challenges that uh, are design specific. So it really depends on what you actually want to compare. You want to discuss this specifically with um, a disciplinary expert in, in, in a way, but just suggesting I'm changing the layout of the app slightly and hope that it, you know, achieves better usage is something that can be explored. Again, I feel this is probably rather in the ex interaction design domain. Um, Yes. So, but uh, perhaps the design students can 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 correct me there if they feel that's no 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 that's that's not what we what what should be done there. But uh, in a computer science uh, setting, you would have some sort of uh, more um, uh, focus on perhaps uh, development and conceptual comparison or algorithmic uh, um, uh, considerations that you know, for example, could could make a difference in user behavior. For example, if the you want to test different different forms of adaptiveness. Uh, or self-balancing, uh, especially in light of the discussion we just had, um, that would be something that would fall under applied computer science more, more, more uh, traditionally. So fundamentally, you're on the right track. The question is just, is it uh, the right disciplinary setting, but also significance? If you just change one color and hope for the best, it's probably not enough to substantiate an entire master's uh, you know, thesis uh, outcome. But no, no, no. Yeah, Professor, I just uh, gave that example because I have no knowledge about the design. I mean... I don't know what changes the uh, customer's motivation, like the yeah. design features, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, um, but in, in terms of an experimental setup, you can think about what would be metrics that are worthwhile collecting to uh, assess improvement and performance and so on, and then bring this for a discussion. Um, can I invite you to bring this to our meeting uh, for the Mac students? You hopefully have noticed that uh, we have set up a meeting on uh Torstag, is it uh, yes thursday um at, at 1 p.m very much in the same room again uh because last week you had uh, expert in teams uh um i think everyone including um, the design people but the max students specifically we have a max session regarding this so it's probably worthwhile bringing it back to those those masters uh thesis related questions more generally back to those discussion points because else uh, a lot of people here right now are uh, will, will be bought by um uh, this discussion because it's not relevant. Um, so, um, any other thoughts? So it's not uh, foregone, I just wanna uh, um, delegate this to this particular session. Um, so the other point I wanted to make is to um, look at exams. I got I got quite a bit of questions already in terms of, okay, how is it gonna happen? And you know, how do you do this and so on? So um, the format for the exams or all, all exams, that sounds scary every time, um, but it shouldn't be. So the idea is that you each of you have a uh, 20 minute slot during which you are uh, in the same uh, room that is virtual room with um, uh, Runa and myself. And we're gonna just ask you some questions, some of them, some of which are more generally about serious games and um, of course relate to the theoretical backing that has been provided over the course of lectures that may come from student lectures, but also of course from our own session, sessions. And there's always a bit of overlap, right? We, we saw for example today, the flow idea again. Um, and, 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 and But those more central concept is of course something we wanna ask about. and. Of course, everyone gets different questions, so uh, we want to avoid any possible um, capitalization on 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 uh, knowledge of prior questions. Um, but uh, we also want to um, we'll ask you more generally um, about uh, perhaps reflections on serious games. Uh, more generally, I think Bjorn did a very good injection by discussing. Okay, how is this actually? Different, or how does the serious games uh, uh, differentiate from other game-based learning? Um, approaches as they're used, for example, in training settings and so on. Those are kind of interesting discussions to follow up on uh, in, in, in order to identify what you are considering serious games and what not, because the field is fuzzy. Uh, and, uh, you know, w every week we find yet another new definition, it seems. Um, so, and uh, as long as you have a clear perspective and clear frame, what you believe is inside and outside, and that's somewhat compatible with the mainstream, uh, I think um, then you'll be on the on the good side. Um, we talk about a lot of uh, psychological models that are, of course, relevant uh, necessarily. We talked a bit about game design, some frameworks related to this. Some of you uh, went a bit deeper into game design. Um, so that's something that could be relevant uh, for you. Um, and uh, challenges specific to particular 
disciplines. Uh, you know, in, 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 in education, it was really about learning, how to facilitate learning, right? In health, what are possible objectives there that want to achieve? We heard quite a bit about those today, actually. Uh, you know, in, 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 in specifically the um, extending the motivation and so on, uh, and what different types of health actually exist. I'm not going into detail there because that's something you guys did brilliantly today. Um, and you know, how which different uh, game uh, um, designs would you know help or foster um, improvement in those directions. Um, and we may. Have I mean yeah yeah so we basically make uh, we'll ask questions with, with respect to the different disciplines and domains that you actually have covered in throughout your lectures on a high level. I'm not asking anyone to learn lectures by heart. That's not really helpful, uh, and you know, yeah, that's not what we do. But to learn the principles, that's the main point. Um, and and uh, think about the themes and have a certain level level of reflection associated with this. The other aspect of course your paper, your respective paper will be read for us. Uh, of course, um, prior to the uh, oral session. And we may ask questions about your very own paper. Um, that may include, just for clarification, uh, this may also include, uh, uh, you know, more reflection on your paper and, uh, you know, um, further refines you may want to offer or, you know, how could you extend it and so on. Um, so along those lines, we'll ask you um, certain aspects as well. Um, so in, 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 So your paper plays a central role as well as part of the oral exam. Uh, we'll make reference to that as well. So it's a kind of big, mixed uh, setup. I don't think it's particularly hard. The idea is you uh, partook in the course and have uh, uh, um, uh, thought about um, the concepts that have come up repeatedly, specifically in the course, um, and underlying principles, then you will be well set up for the exam. It shouldn't, it's not meant to test you out, it's rather to test you in. Uh, that means uh, to assess that you actually partook in the course. Does that make sense? Um, any any questions regarding this? Uh, just one real quick question. Uh, the oral exam, is that just a, uh, like the main uh, thing that we get our, I guess, grading from will be the paper and uh, I guess, only like the paper will be the main thing, right? And then you will have this, just the oral exam will be an addition. Uh, or is it a It's a pass compound fail? mark. It's, it's, uh, no, 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 it's a compound mark. What, what do you mean pass fail? The oral exam is a pass fail? Yeah, is that's it, what I'm asking. Is it uh, a no, pass it's fail? A compound, it a, it's a yeah, okay. compound mark. The reason is, yeah, the reason is as follows. Um, um, in, in the past, that's our experience, and that's partially why we in the Max in particular do masters with presentations, that some people are really are doing brilliant work, but are struggling to express this uh, written. Uh, or conversely, they're doing brilliant work and are able to convey this con uh, uh, quite nicely in written form, but struggle to do that orally. So we'll, we'll, uh, it's kind of a bit of leveraging um, the students, uh, giving a students opportunity to, you know, uh, perform the best possible, right? So sometimes also you you, you write this report and you realize, oh, I should have, right? So you realize that two days later, but then you have still a chance to bug fix this to some extent in the context of the oral exam as well, right? Or if you think you did a, a good, good report and we disagree otherwise, we can still use that um, oral uh, exam session for a basis of discussion and see perhaps you have, you know, um, ideas that would actually fix some of the concerns that we have, or perhaps we're just meeting, reading your report in, uh, based on misconceptions and so on. So I, that, that's how you would read this um, 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 construction of both um, written and um, oral exams. So they're complementary. And I think generally in a student's favor, not really as to, so, so I mean, I, I wouldn't fold on the idea, uh, uh, or I wouldn't suggest just to submit the report and forget about the rest and then just hope that you pass the exam. But actually I think it, it, it uh, interacts with each other. Yeah, right. thanks. That makes sense. Um, so in, Preparation for this, um, or, or in preparation rather for this uh, commitment. Uh, hang on. Um, I added two new um, entries into the wiki page. One of them is related to report submission, and the other one is the OR exam time slots. And um, Okay, um, and, and, and so I'm not sure, do you see those? You should be able to edit those as well. If, uh, Nicola, if you were to unshare your screen, I can share my screen briefly. So um, I can sh just show people what they are um, supposed to see. 
and uh, if I share the right screen, I think that is the right screen. Uh, you should see those two ones. On the one hand is the uh, submission form, which is actually SharePoint form. So uh, um, as you as you notice, we put great effort into um, providing you with uh, GDPR compliant uh, forms in the meantime. So at least we try. So I use the Microsoft SharePoint one. Let's see how that goes. Uh, you need to authenticate using FIDA as usual, and then basically just submit your uh, report and provide potential additional comments if you have any. Yeah. So that's really more um, to, to address potential challenges uh, or comments we should bear in mind when reading your report. The other one is the uh, perhaps more, more interesting one uh, is the timesheet. Can you see this in your respective screens? Oh yeah, everyone is on it. <laughs> okay, that was not necessary to ask. Uh, and the idea is here that, um, yeah, the interaction seems to work. Um, Yes, um, so please populate um, a preferred time slot there. I think that's that's roughly the idea. Um, we will uh, we, 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 we will hold um, we reserve the right for potential uh, modifications or adjustments based on uh, uh, time constraints or individual level constraints that are relevant and need to be considered, especially in the uh, current situation. But fundamentally, please pre-indicate your interest, uh, your, 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 your preferred time frame. Um, and then we use this as a basis for the exam. It highlights the in two columns the uh, dates for both the Tuesday and the Wednesday. Uh, and you can kind of work around um, your obligations. The, 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 does anyone see uh, major conflicts with, res with respect to class activities in any other subject. Please note, it's the 12th and 13th of May. That is actually after the official lecture period. But nevertheless, especially on the master's level, we appreciate that there are sometimes um, uh, extraordinary uh, arrangements for certain courses uh, that run a bit longer, such as for ours, for example, we'll have one extended serious game session uh, due to uh, timing conflicts uh, earlier in the semester. So uh, even in, in May, we'll still have one session, which is probably good um, anyway. Um, but um, is there any anything you guys are aware of that could uh, One thing, I think uh, the people who have uh, the mobile course have uh, oral exam on the 13th, on the Wednesday. Okay. Then they probably should get pref uh, uh, priority on the on the Tierstag on the Tuesday. Oh, we need to talk to Marius, uh, or you guys need to talk to Marius, up to you, um, to, to force him to move away from this. Uh, if there's too much overlap, because we have considerable overlap, I believe, right? Just to get a feel, how many people are actually in, um, I will unshare this here for now. How many people are in uh, mobile? Can you just raise your hands or click yes or something or whatever, what people do? Oh, yeah, that sounds scary, yeah, isn't it? Let's see. Hang on. Hang on, please be patient. I'm slow. Uh, we that's a lot. That is quite a bit. So I'm I'm reckoning it's about eight eight to nine, perhaps you know, give or take ten people. Um, yeah, okay. So we need to ensure that you are definitely in in in, in a no, no conflict zone, or we need to talk to Marsh to see if he can shift it shift his course to um, Thursday possibly, because um, this this date has been set off quite a bit earlier hours already. So I don't think there should be any conflict. So I encourage the ones that realize the conflict to, to allocate a time frame that works better for them. Um, so uh, to choose the slot that works best for them. Good. Any questions regarding any of this? Um, what, whatever I said right now and the sheet and all that kind of stuff. Take this as a no. Um, Silence means no, I believe, uh, in this context. Um, anyway, yeah, be nice people. Don't uh, delete each other's entries from the Google Sheets because I know you can and you know you can. Um, but it would be nice to just uh, um, respect each other's choices. Um, if you have certain constraints that uh, require, yeah, you know, constraints to certain time slots other than a mobile aspect, please mail me and I'll deal with this. Uh, so it may well happen that we need to reschedule some individual talks based on time constraints. Sorry for that, but it's it, that's sometimes a bit problematic. 
uh, and we can't really anticipate this uh, sufficiently. Um, any other questions? Anything you want me to ask? Yeah, I got a question. Mm -hmm. uh, is it still possible to uh, hand in the uh, pre-draft of the, the paper? Um, I'm slightly behind on some. Um, I still have one through you. Yeah, you can still run hand on a pre-draft for the paper. Um, okay, so uh, until tomorrow, is that fine? That would be okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. I'll uh, have a look at this. Um, yeah, so it's, yeah. Yeah, please don't expect an immediate, immediate response, but uh, look at this as up. Um, yeah. Any okay, other questions? Thank you. Qu You're welcome. Any other questions? No, it doesn't seem so. Well, um, I leave it. We leave it at this then. Um, so thank you very much for your participation. We're well over time, um, um, but yeah, so it happens. Um, and well, I guess we reconvene next week for our next uh, topic. And uh, yeah, the respective group, please uh, just uh, get in touch with me uh, early so we can just discuss the paper and topics and so on. Um, so this, this week was rather more development heavy. So there was less focus on the, uh, um, paper discussion per se due to the development, that's okay. Um, but uh, please get in touch so we can negotiate this reasonably early. Um, and yeah, if anything else, um, write in the Discord chat, um, ask me questions elsewhere. Uh, again, for the Mac students specifically, please show up on Thursday, especially if you have questions regarding masters, but there will also be a bit of an introduction about you know what's to come next. Meaning you're not you're required to take any immediate action, but rather to give you a heads up on what's going to happen next. Uh, it's going to happen next semester, but also an opportunity for you to ask questions you might have, both to me, uh, but also Runa or uh, Hilda in particular, uh, with respect to administrative challenges that you guys face, especially in this time, uh, but of course also independent from this. So I would encourage you to to partake there um, as well. So did you guys see the notification? Can we get? Can anyone give me a feedback on this one? As a ways, as opposed to um, you know. The, did you hear about this somewhere, somehow? Okay, so on Discord is fine, that's right. Uh, we also put it on Insia, uh, I know, yeah, there you go. Ha, someone saw it on Insia. You, you will make Hilda very happy. Um, so, um, yeah, exactly. So please uh, uh, sign up there. Um, last week was quite funny, none of the Mac students showed up. But uh, information security people showed up. That was very funny. So um, uh, we 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 gave them as much as advice as we could. Um, so I I would be equally happy to see some of the interaction design people showing up just for the fun of it. Um, but um, so it's quite interesting. But here explicit notice to the Mac students, please um, uh, cover that time and just just pop in and see if it's something for you or not. But at least you get some information. Other than this, uh, thank you very much for your time again and um, have a great week. And we see each other next week at uh, 12 o'clock as usual. And thank you to participants in particular. Great job. I really liked the presentation. Uh, you did a really, really great job and you know, kept the flow going. And I think it was exciting throughout the uh, entire discussion, including your question and humorous takes on the paper. Yeah. <laughs>